Well, good morning again. I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, <clears throat> if you've been around Catalyst for very long and, and, and listened to any of the messages that I've given before, um, it's, it's not going to be a surprise to you that we have technical difficulties at times. Sometimes it's, it's user error. A lot of times it's user error where I'll forget to turn on my microphone or I always have difficulty getting this silly headset on. Um, and today, I, it got, I put, it, put it on the first time. I thought, yes, I got it. If you could have been here at 9 o'clock, oh, my goodness. Uh, it was, it, I can laugh now. I wasn't laughing then. But a lot of distractions. We're going to talk about that today. Now, it's Father's Day. Let's go back just about a month or five weeks or so. I went to another church. I was asked to give a, a message at another church on Mother's Day. And technical difficulties followed me there. And they, they, were, they had a wireless headset. This one's not wireless, but it was a wireless headset. Never done it before. And they said, here, put it on. And I just, for the life of me, could not get that thing on. And I just messed with it, messed with it. I said, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to go. Let me go into the bathroom where I can look in the mirror. And then I can see what I'm doing. Then I'll be able to get the headset on. So I went in, into the bathroom, and I, no luck. And I am struggling and saying some things. And it, they were bad but they were I'm saying some things and like man why does it always happen and it wasn't too long and the sound guy comes in the bathroom and he said can I help you and I said you know, yeah you can and he took that wireless thing and he looked at it and he said you see this little green button right here this light that's flashing and I said yeah and he said that's the mute button everybody in the church could hear you <laughs> and I was like man I'm at a church I'd not been to before, have to give a message, and I have to face these people after that. So little did I know that it actually ties into today's message, but uh, I overcame that. I overcame some of the obstacles this morning in the first service, uh, so it'll be fine. So let's pray, and we'll get started. Lord, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you for uh, the message that you've given to me, and Lord, I just pray right now that you would use me as your mouthpiece, that whatever needs to be spoken, Lord, would be what I say, and Lord, that not only will we hear uh, the words, but Lord, we would listen to your voice and that we would follow. Uh, Lord, so we look forward to what you're going to do in and through this message, not only today, but in the coming days and weeks. We love you and pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so this passage that we're going to talk about this morning is, is something we reference almost every single week, if not every single week. Uh, and we'll find this passage on page 586 in the blue Bible in the seats in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, you can turn to that. It's in James chapter 1, and we're going to be going through verses 19 through 25. Now, if, if you don't have a Bible, that blue Bible, you can keep that as yours. Uh, that's just a gift from us. So uh, anyway, that's where we're going to be, and I'm going to read through those scriptures, and then we're going to dive into uh, uh, the message. So here we go. Starting in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer, who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, listen to God and do what he says. We hear that all the time here, and it's on the wall right over there. And interesting that that passage I just read out of the English Standard Version, the word listen is nowhere in there. It says hear, be quick to hear. But if you read the NIV version, it says quick to listen. So it depends on what it is. Though hearing and listening are oftentimes used interchangeably. But what we're going to look at this morning is that there actually is a difference between hearing and listening, and it's a significant difference, and that's what we want to make sure that we understand and focus on today. 
So that's where we're going to start, is we're going to look at Webster's Dictionary. What does it say about hearing, and what does it say about listening, and then we'll go from there. So Webster's D Dictionary on hearing says this. It's the process, the function, or power of perceiving sound. It's the special sense by which noises and tones are received as stimuli. It's passive, physical act that requires one sense. We hear sounds and words all day long. Sounds and words all day long. But listening, here's what it says about listening. To pay attention to the sound. To hear something with thoughtful attention. To give consideration. So listening shows a curiosity. It's to give attention. It shows an interest in what you are hearing. Verse 22 said, as we just read, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So in order to do what God says, in order to, what we have to do is we first have to hear what he says, then we have to listen to it. We have to give attention to what we're hearing, and then when we do that, we have to put into practice, we have to put into action what we just listened to. Now here's a quote from Charles Spurgeon that I think is critical for us to, to read. I fear, this is what he said, I fear we have many such in all congregations, admiring hearers, affectionate hearers, attached hearers, but all the while unblessed hearers, because they are not doers of the work. See, hearing is passive. We hear sounds all the time. Listening is active. It's active. Now let me go back to the bathroom thing that I was telling you about from the other church. All right, so they heard sounds coming out of the bathroom, but there's no doubt they don't, they didn't, they weren't probably listening to what I said because they were, I'm sure, distracted by their laughter. We get distracted easily. Distractions are huge. They're things that take priority over the things that are the most important. So that's where we get the phrases in one ear and out the other ear. We hear it, but we're not really listening. It just goes in and out. Or it you might be hearing me, but you're not listening to me. Heard those things before? So hearing and listening, there, there is a difference there. Now, have you ever come to church, listened, or excuse me, heard a message before at church, and then left, and an hour or two later had absolutely no idea what church service was all about? Has anybody ever done that? I know I have. I've done that. Of course it's going to happen. Why? Because we're in a battle. We're in a battle with an enemy that doesn't want us to listen. He doesn't care if we hear. He just doesn't want us to do anything with it. He doesn't want us to do anything with what we hear. He just wants it to go in and out of one ear, in one ear and out the other. That's the battle that we're in. Now, not only on a Sunday morning, but it happens when you're at, it can happen when you're at home. How many of you have ever read your Bible or whatever? It could be just a book. Read a paragraph or a passage or whatever, and you get to the end of it and you think, what was it I just read? Anybody ever done that? I know I've done that. And you got to go back and you got to do it again. There's a difference. Actually, did you realize that when you read something, you can act, that you're actually, there's a voice to that? So when you're, when you're reading something, it might be your own voice that you hear. But you're, those words are going in your mind and you're, you're hearing the sound of that and it could be coming from your voice. Or it could be coming from someone else who sent you a message. Maybe you got a message from someone else, some, especially somebody that you're familiar with or somebody that you're really close to. See, when I was, when I was dating my wife-to-be back in college, uh, we sent cards and letters. We didn't have texting and all that stuff back then. We sent actual cards and letters to one another. And when I would get one of those things from her, I would open it up and I would, I would read it. And it was I, I could hear maybe not audibly, but I could hear her voice in that. And I was paying attention. I wanted to know what she was thinking. I wanted to know what she was saying. I was actually listening to what she wrote to me. I was listening to that. That's what it's like when we read the Bible. Or it should be what it's like when we read the Bible. It's Jesus talking to us. It's God's Word speaking to us. And hopefully, when we're doing that, we can learn more about Jesus we can become more intimate with Jesus, and we can follow him more closely. 
So we need to be listening to what God's Word says. John 1.1 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So on that sign, we say, listen to God and do what He says. We don't, it doesn't say you listen to Jesus, but actually it does, because Jesus and God are one and the same. So if we're listening to Jesus, if we're listening to Him, we're listening to God the Father. So we're actually doing that. John 14, 6 and 7 says this, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So as we hear words on a Sunday morning or as we read our Bible throughout the week, the question is this, are we listening to the words? And do those words move us to action? Because listening is action. See, there's a world full of people that have heard about Jesus. They've heard about Jesus. There's a world full of people that some, maybe they've read parts of the Bible, maybe they've read the whole Bible. But hearing does not automatically translate into listening. Here's what it says in John 10, 4. When he has brought out all his own, talking about Jesus, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. See, a person can't listen to God and do what he says. They can't follow. They can't take action. They can't do any of that unless they know the voice that's speaking to them, unless they know the voice of Jesus. There are many, many religious people in the world that have no personal relationship with Jesus. They may go to church all the time but they don't know Jesus. Romans 10, 13 to 17 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him who have not believed? They have not believed. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And here's the key verse that comes right after that, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. You may have heard it, but there's no action. There's no action behind it. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. Now that may seem a little bit confusing now. Okay, I've talked about listening and hearing. And it says faith comes from hearing. It does. Let's look, and I'll explain it to him. I'll break it down as simply as I can. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay. So first, what has to happen is we have to receive the gift of grace through Jesus, that gift of salvation that is offered freely to everyone in the world. Then, that's first. Then, verse 10 comes, and here's what it says. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So once we receive that grace in then we are created for good work. We are created for action. That's when the action needs to take place. It's when we understand and we absorb what the true gospel meaning is. We're created to follow him and to walk in those works, to be his workmanship. Now, I do want you to listen closely because I don't want this to get twisted. James 2 is telling us the same thing. And I struggled with this, this passage for a long time. So I'm going to go through it and hopefully I'll be able to clear some of it up if you have questions about it. Chapter 2, verse 17, we're going to go through 22, but we're going to start with 17. So also by faith, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now Ephesians just told us that we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. Here it says, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. So the two things do go together, but faith, we are, we are not saved based upon our works. What I'm telling you this is this, that faith is more than just an intellectual belief. 
It's more than just an intellectual belief. Faith is actually a heart issue. True saving faith, true actual belief in Jesus will create a heart change inside of us. And that heart change is what produces the works that come out. So faith is, is a contingent upon, excuse me, works is contingent upon the faith that comes behind it, but works does not save us. Let's keep going and, and, and read through verse 22, and that'll drive it home a little bit more. So also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. That's, I'm going to stop there for a second. That is important. Intellectual belief is not the same as a faith that produces works. Demons believe in God. Demons believe in Jesus. That alone is not enough to save you because demons don't have a heart for God. Demons don't follow God. That's what true saving faith does it will give you that heart to follow God and the actions will come from that so you can have an intellectual belief and not have a true saving faith lots of people can tell you and do tell you probably from time to time I believe Jesus came to earth he died for my sins he he you know he rose again they can tell you all that stuff but it doesn't necessarily mean it is that could be just an intellectual thing keep going verse 20 do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Faith has to come along with that for it to be a true saving faith. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. It does go hand in hand. Faith and works do go hand in hand. But the works don't save you. It's an outflow of what's already done, what Jesus has done to change your heart. Listen, you can come to church every single week, and you can hear the gospel of Jesus every single week. You can hear about the Lord, all those things, yet never listen. That it doesn't take root, that there's no action that comes along with that. You can recite it. It could be an intellectual belief. It tells us the same things in Proverbs 22. Listen to this. It's on the screen, 17 through 19. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply. There's your, there's your works. There's your action. And apply your heart to my knowledge. For it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, if all of them are ready on your lips, that your trust may be in the Lord. May be in the Lord. I have made them known to you today, even to you. So here's some questions that you need to contemplate. I really ask you to do that. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Lots of people will tell you that they put their faith and trust. Jesus has saved them. But there's, it's deeper than that. Follow, stay with me. Your eternal destination depends on this, okay? John 3, 16 to 18. You've heard this before, but listen to what it's saying. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Yes, Jesus came to save. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son. The question is, what do you believe about Jesus? Is he just your Savior? Is that your belief? Or is he your Savior and Lord? Those two things go hand in hand. It's more than an intellectual belief. That faith, that belief that has resulted in a heart change that is completed by your works. Hang with me. Okay, I'm not done. Hang with me. If you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, here's what you need to do. Here's your action plan, okay? Yes, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, so listen closely. Repent of your sins. We are all sinners. We are all in need of a Savior. Lots of people can tell you that. 
acknowledge that you're a sinner that needs a Savior, and trust Jesus to be that Savior for you. Okay, that's the first thing. But then you've got to put your trust in Jesus as Lord of your life. That's the action step, okay? We're not saving ourselves from this, but this is the outflow. This is the true saving, saving faith that we're talking about when Jesus becomes your Lord. Not just your Savior, but your Lord also. That means he's your master. That means he's your leader. That means he is the one that you follow. That's an action. Those are actions. We're going to listen to our master. We're going to listen to our leader. We're going to follow him. There's, there's the action that comes along with that saving faith. Now, we, I hope that makes sense to you. We all have free choice to whether or not we want to accept that gift or not. But it's more, it's more than just right here in the mind. There's lots of people that can tell you that. Again, I, I can't say this enough. Demons can tell you that. They just don't believe it. They know God is real. They know Jesus is real. They're just not going to follow him. They're just not going to follow him. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Anybody that doesn't put their faith and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord, that you're going to follow, that that faith is moved to action. If you don't do that, one day when you die, you're going to be eternally separated from God. That's what God's Word says. So really think about that. Really think about what is your faith. Is it intellectual or has it created a true heart change inside of you? Now, for those of you that are, that are Christ followers, that have already made that decision for Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, we're still going to struggle to listen to God at times. That doesn't go away because we're in, we're in this world, this sinful world, full of stuff. And we're in a battle. And the enemy does not want us to listen to God and do what he says. He doesn't care if we hear. That doesn't bother him. He, what he doesn't want us to do is to put that into action. That, that, he's, he's totally going to fight us against that. So our struggle could be, and I hope that it's not, but it could be sometimes willful disobedience, which means I know what God says, I know what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to choose not to, not going to do it. That's being defiant towards God. We definitely don't want to do that, but we could. We have free choice every single day of how we're going to respond to God. It could mean that there is a lack of love and respect for God. John 14, 15 says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's an action behind that. If you love me, you're going to follow me, all right? If we don't spend time with God, if we don't get in his word, if we don't listen to his voice, then we can't bear fruit. We can't bear fruit. This is not on the screen. John 15, 4 says this, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. You can't do anything by yourself apart from Jesus. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So by putting our Bible aside and saying, oh, I'll do that tomorrow, or I'll do that later, or whatever, and we kind of push it off, the question is, where, where is your heart towards God? Where is that love towards God? Is he the priority of your life? Are you going to make time for him and keep the distractions away. We're going to talk about distractions just in a moment because that's usually what it is. It's usually not the first two. Well, it could be, it could be the first two, but it's usually that we are distracted by things that are going on, and then we're not listening because of that. Now, I'm going to give you four things that we are distracted by. Now, there could be a whole lot more than this, but these are the four that came to my mind. It distracts us from listening to God, and it starts with the sounds. We're talking about hearing. We hear things all the time, even when we're reading. Even if it's silent around us, when we're reading, we're hearing. We're hearing a voice. Those words are coming off a page. The question is, are we listening? The first thing that I think of that distracts us are clocks and electronics. Clocks and electronics. We are driven by the clock. This, this culture is driven by the clock. We got to go to work at a certain time and get off work at a certain time. We got to go to school and do this during a certain time frame. We, we plan family activities, and we're looking and, and putting on the calendar when it's going to happen and what time we're going to do this or that, doctor's appointments, those kinds of things, recreational events. We could keep that list going and going, but we're, we are driven by the time. We're driven by the clock. Now, uh, many of you know Wes, and uh, Wes is, is most likely in his last days here. Uh, but he, when the decision was made for... Uh, him to stop doing dialysis 
um, I went over to see him, and he told me this. Now, he had no idea that this was what message I was going to share today. This is what he said. I've never heard the Lord's voice more clearly than I do right now. His view of time had changed. No more doctor's appointments. No more dialysis visits. No more things that he had to do. This was what was left of him, and his focus could be more on God. He eliminated the distractions. And these were his words. I'm not distracted anymore. That's what he told me. I'm not distracted anymore. And I was thinking, wow, that's exactly what I'm getting ready to speak on. So I know it's true. It's true with Wes. It's incredible to watch him finish out his days and the faith that he had and the, the ability and his desire to spend time with God. Even now before he goes to be face-to-face with Jesus, he said, these last two weeks have been a gift to him, a gift. And, and it is a gift to us. The question is, what are we going to do with that gift? It kind of goes back to the salvation thing. Jesus has give, The gift of, of Jesus has been given to us by God to give us eternal life. What are we going to do with the gift? Are we going to do something with it, or are we just going to set it to the side? Now, computers, radios, TVs, all that stuff can be distractions. Now, they're good. And they have a place, and we can enjoy those things. There's absolutely nothing wrong with those. Nothing wrong with those. But if we're not careful, they can occupy a whole lot of our time, and they can become big distractions to us. Cell phones. I did not bring my cell phone up here. I'll ever bring it up here on purpose. Um, But it has Wi-Fi. It's got GPS, Bluetooth. All those things are great. It gives us access to a lot of stuff but it can be a huge distraction to our ability to listen to when your phone's going off all the time. It it seems good. It seems good that it keeps us connected and all that kind of stuff, and it it is. Again, it's good. It's what we let it do, how we let it control us. I just think I was in a meeting uh, this last week, and I don't know how many times my phone would, a ding would go off, whether it was a text message or an email or some reminder that I had set on my phone, and it was like ding, ding, ding. I just had to turn, I got to turn this thing off. It's, it's driving me crazy. It was just too much. Uh, good stuff, just it was, a, it was becoming a distraction. That's why we, we silence our cell phones on Sunday morning. Think what that would be like if everybody had their cell phone on and text message alerts and all that stuff came through. We would be distracted all the time. All right, so that's one. It would be pretty difficult to listen with all those distractions. Here's another distraction. Information overload. It comes sometimes with the computers. It comes with our cell phones and all that kind of stuff, social media. We get instantaneous access to information. Years ago, you didn't get that. You had to wait for the newspaper to come out or whatever before you knew what was going on in the world. Now it's instant, and you got it all the time. And the more time we spend on that, the more information that gets into your mind. And what it does is, one, it just wears you down. It'll just wear you down. It'll make you tired. One, you may not think straight. Another thing, you're going to start missing things. Things that are important, you're going to miss it because you're, you're pulled off on something else that's not nearly as important. We don't, we, don't let, we don't give ourselves enough room in our mind sometimes to allow God to speak to us, to be able to listen to him clearly. And you get the idea of what I'm talking about there. The third one is unmet expectations. So a lot of times this happens in our prayer life. So we'll have a certain prayer that we have on our heart or someone that we want to pray for, something that's really important to us, and we start praying about it. And if we're honest, we probably have an expectation of how we want God to answer that prayer, first off. And then we might even have a time frame put in, put in our mind, maybe not spoken, but a hope that God is going to answer that immediately. Part of that's because our culture teaches that, that the microwave, the microwave thinking So what we do is we we get the same, we start to pray, and then a week passes by, and we haven't seen any kind of movement in our prayer request. We haven't seen any answer come through, and we can get distracted by that. We can get frustrated by that, and and frustration actually is low-level anger. We'll get to that in just a second. It's actually low-level anger, and then what happens? We quit. We give up. We stop praying for those things that were so important to us, but because we don't get what we want, the expectation that we have for God to answer our prayer the way we want it to be answered, then we quit. 
That's a distraction. We don't want to do that. It creates a barrier in our relationship with God, and it definitely hinders our ability to hear him speak because we're occupied with something else. And if you don't hear, it's impossible to listen to him. Then we can't do what he says. So don't let disappointments stop you in your tracks. And here's the fourth distraction, and it's, it's unrealistic expectations. And it's very similar to unmet expectations, just a little bit of a twist. So you don't have to answer this out loud, but just I know me, and I know how it's been with me before. I get into God's Word, and I have an, an expectation that I am going to understand everything that I read. You get, in, you get into your Bible study in the morning, maybe you're in the middle of uh, Old Testament, deep in the Old Testament, going through genealogies, and you're thinking, what in the world is this? I don't understand any of this. What's the point of reading this? I'm just going to stop reading it. Do we not do that? We think we should understand everything, or we hope that we will understand everything that we read so we can get closer to God. But when we don't, we can just put it away and say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I know I've been there. I've been there before. Here's a quote by Francis Chan, I think is, is, is key, then we'll get into a couple, couple scriptures. Not being able to fully understand God is frustrating. Remember, frustration is, is a low-level anger. You can get frustrated with God, but not understanding what he's saying. But it's ridiculous for us to think we have a right to limit God to something we are capable of understanding. We are not going to understand everything. That doesn't mean we stop listening. We stop reading. We stop hearing so we can listen. At some point when he's ready, just like the clock, we don't work on God's timetable. And at some point, I've read things before and I come back to them months later and I reread it and I'll, ah, now, now I got it. Maybe at the time you were reading it, it wasn't time for you to understand that. Just wait. We need to be patient. We are very, very impatient, impatient, excuse me, in this culture. And it can hinder our, our relationship with God. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's mind is so much beyond ours, so much beyond ours. And we know that, yet we allow, it to, get, we allow to get frustrated at times. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. We're not going to understand everything that God is speaking to us, but that doesn't mean we stop listening. And he will reveal it when it's time. We do our best, and if we don't get it, don't get frustrated with it. Just say, okay, Lord, in your time, you'll let me know what I'm supposed to know about this in your time. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. To acknowledge God means to know God. So all this is training us. All this is training. And God's timing is perfect. He will reveal things to you when it's time to be revealed. Don't let that, get, don't let that become a distraction to you when you don't understand. It's, it's also, but it's also a great opportunity to reach out to somebody else. If you really want to know and it's really eating at you, reach out to somebody else that you trust, that you think, oh, this person knows the scriptures better than I do. Reach out to them. Maybe, maybe let them disciple you and walk you through that. It's a great opportunity to do that. So we can actually train our ears to listen to God, to listen to his voice. And that's what we're going to look at the remainder of the time here. So we're going to go back to James uh, verse 19 and 20 and look at that again. All right, it says this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Remember, frustration we just talked about is low-level anger. That is anger. And the order of this, the, the order that it is written is very important. The first thing it says is be quick to hear or be quick to listen. That's the first thing. The second thing is be slow to speak. So we need to listen more than we speak. And when we get that out of whack, when we get that out of whack and we get ahead, we become susceptible to anger. We become very susceptible to anger. It's that frustration that I was talking about. So I've heard this about the way we were created, and maybe you've heard this before too. This is why we have two ears and one mouth, because we're supposed to listen twice as much as we're supposed to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. 
Now, in a message Larry gave several months ago, I don't remember exactly when, but I do remember him saying that the average person speaks somewhere around 16,000 words a minute. Or a minute. Ooh, man, that's a lot. 16,000 words. You were listening, right? That was a test. Uh, 16,000 words a day. 16,000 words a day. Now, if we're supposed to listen more than we speak, how many words are, should we be absorbing in a day? How much more should we be listening? That is a lot of listening. So what I have for you as a reminder is a card that looks like this, and it's sitting outside. It's a picture of the dog. It's got two ears and one mouth, just like we do, and it's quick to listen, quick to hear, slow to speak, listen to God, and do what he says. And it's got the scripture passage. The interesting thing, when I started working on this message, I didn't know this, but next month our, our new scripture verse is going to be out of this passage. So this is not going to go uh, on deaf ears, hopefully. Uh, you'll actually listen to that, and you'll be able to use it more than a, more than a month. So uh, now what I was going to do, because i got a dog up here, what I was going to do is I was going to go out and buy a dog whistle, and I was going to use that as an illustration. Then I thought, well, that's pretty silly, isn't it? because we can't hear dog whistles. <laughs> so why in the world would I do a dog whistle? Now, do you know why we can't hear dog whistles? Anybody? Frequency, yeah, but I think the more basic thing is that dogs can't whistle. So we're not going to be able to hear them. But, you know, a dog whistle is silent to us. They're silent to us, but there's a sound that the dogs actually hear. And they respond to that whistle when it comes. And that's how it should be for us as Christ followers. As we hear God's word, there should be a response that comes out of that. Even, even in awe, if you don't understand something, you just say, God, you are so great and so much more than what I am. Thank you for reminding me that I don't have it all together and that I don't know everything. So even turning that lack of understanding into a praise of God, we can do that. Now, God speaks to us in many, many ways. He speaks to us on Sunday mornings. He speaks to us at our Bible readings at our house or at our home or wherever we're at at work. He speaks through other people. He speaks through prayer. He speaks through wonders of his creation, like the eclipse that we had not too long ago or the northern lights that we were able to enjoy. He speaks to us through life circumstances. He even spoke through a donkey in Numbers chapter 22. He speaks to us in a lot of different ways. But here's how he spoke to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. God spoke in a gentle whisper. He did. That's where our training has to start. Now, the word listen, it's on the screen. The word listen has six characters in it. If you scramble those around, there's another word embedded in there. Does anybody know what it might be? Silent. That's right, silent. So, quick, think about it this way, quick to be silent so we can hear, so we can listen. Be quick to do that. But see, in our culture, we don't like silence. We don't like silence. We, oftentimes, we don't like when there's silence, thoughts come into our mind and things that we, we don't want to have to deal with that, we're, that are there. So we like to drown it out with noise, whatever noise that is, because I don't want to deal with that today. I don't want to do that. So we, we find it hard to, to get silent time. Sometimes we don't even want to have silent time. I've been in my car recently, and, and I've, the first thing I do when I get in there is I turn on the radio. And, and lately I've been turning it back off and say, no, I'm not going to listen to that right now. I'm going to listen to whatever God wants to speak, and then I'll drive in silence somewhere. And that, that's just something I'm trying to train myself to do. You don't have to do that, but however you figure it out, that's important that we get some silence in there. Now, we do this by creating an intentional plan and putting, it into, and putting it into practice. We need to find time to be alone with God in silence where we're not distracted, where we can actually hear and then listen to him. And we need to train our ears to do that. So why? So we can know God more intimately and follow Jesus more closely. Now, here's what I mean by that. 
a mechanic. A mechanic can hear a car engine and he can detect a problem in the engine. He knows, he, I just hear an engine. I don't, I don't know what's wrong, but a, a mechanic has trained his ears to know this is the problem. He can detect that just by listening to the sound of the engine. Same thing with a heart doctor. Can listen, listen to your heart, it can tell whether or not there's something going on in there, an irregular beat or whatever. They've trained their ears to hear those things. A lung doctor, same thing. Listen to our breathing and all that stuff. They know, they can tell what's going on. And then a mom. When their baby's crying, they can be in a room of 20 babies and moms know which baby is theirs. They've trained their ears to hear, hear that sound. They know, they know. So we can train our ears. Now, this may be hard for you to believe, but this is truth. There is actually at least this one thing I know that we can learn from the United States government. That's hard to find things we can learn from them, but we can learn this from the United States government. They have created a place called the National Radio Quiet Zone. And it's the quietest electronic area in the United States. It's a place where there's no cell phones, no Wi-Fi, no wireless devices, none of that stuff is there. And it's in Green Bank, West Virginia. It's a small population of people there. There's mountains all around it that kind of shield the sound waves from coming in, not to mention all the other distractions that they don't allow in. And it, it's a perfect place for the Ob Green Bank Observatory. Now, this is 13,000 square miles. So this, is a, this is a big area, and it's preventing radio wave interference, and it has a giant telescope. Now, this observatory is, a, is the size of a football field. I mean, it's big, and it's got a telescope on there, and they need silence because that telescope is going out into the, into the universe, and it is actually listening to the movement of pulsars and galaxies out in the universe millions of miles away. But it needs that silence to be able to hear that. We need that silence to be able to hear God's voice. We need to be able to drown that stuff out and put those things down and actually listen to God. Hear what he says and then listen to him and do what he says. So we're going to practice this. I'm going to close it out with this. We're going to practice this for a second and practice learning to listen. So what I'm going to do, we're not going to play a song at the end, but I'm going to read the lyrics to a gospel song. And I want you to listen to the words. I want you to close your eyes and listen to these words. So we're going to practice listening. Okay, here we go. Hard as it seems, standing in dreams, where is the dreamer now? Wonder if I wanted to try, would I remember how? I don't know the way to go from here, but I know that I have made my choice. And this is where I stand until he moves me on. And I will listen to his voice. This is the faith, patient to wait. When there is nothing clear, nothing to see, still we believe Jesus is very near. I cannot imagine what will come, but I've already made my choice. And this is where I stand until he moves me on. And I will listen to his voice. Could it be that he is only waiting there to see if I will learn to love the dreams that he has dreamed for me? Can't imagine what the future holds, but I've already made my choice. And this is where I stand until he moves me on. And I will listen to his voice. Okay. Has anybody ever heard that song before? All right. Actually, I made sure that this song was being played as you were walking into the church this morning. Right before the service started, this song was playing in the speakers, but nobody heard it. Lots of distractions. We can get distracted when we walk in here. We can get distracted all, in all kinds of places. That's just an example. I mean, I, I don't always catch all that. You, you can't catch it all. But it, the, the point is that we're so easily distracted. We're so easily distracted. Uh, so uh, I want you to think about this week. Think about that this week. Uh, let me pray and uh, close this out. Father God, thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son here to save us 
from the sins. Save us from eternal punishment, the death that we deserve because of our sins. Lord, thank you that you've given us your word, which is Jesus, but the word that we have in written form, that we can hear your voice, we can hear your words, Lord, that we have the opportunity to listen and follow. Uh, Lord, thank you for um, the, that you still pursue. You still pursue people. Uh, even those that have not made the choice to follow you, we all have a choice. And Lord, if there's anybody in here today that has not made the choice to make Jesus not only Savior, but Lord of their life, that they're going to follow him in the way that he wants us to go. Lord, if they have not done that, I pray today would be their day of salvation. But for us that do know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Lord, may we listen to you may every day, every single day. May we learn to tune our ears uh, to your voice. May we learn to listen to you so that we can be uh, the best vessels possible as we go out into this dark world and share the love of Jesus with others that are lost and that are perishing apart from you. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for that love. Thank you for your patience with us, because we mess it up sometimes, but you continue to love us, and you've given us unlimited forgiveness. And for that, we are eternally grateful. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I really hope that you have a great week. I hope that uh, you're able to think about this as we go this week, to actually give consideration to the difference between hearing and listening. Uh, there's lots of... Lots of examples that are going on. There's a whole, God is speaking in a whole lot more ways than we realize if we just pay attention, if we pay attention more. So I hope that you're challenged for this week, and I really hope that you have, for you men out there that are fathers, I hope you have a great Father's Day, and I hope the rest of you have a great day and a great rest of your week.